and I am streaming to you from my childhood bedroom in Orange County, California, and there's a motorcycle going by. I thought I would get on here. I was supposed to have a call, actually, and I have a kind of very minor streaming setup here, brought a few things to be able to record in case I needed to, and in fact, didn't really end up using them. So <laughs> I thought I would just get on here and record something. I am at the very tail end of reading a book called Greek Buddha by Christopher Beckwith. And that book I started maybe a month or two ago is about the possible or putative relationship between early Buddhism, pre-sectarian Buddhism, as Beckwith calls it, and a branch of skeptical Greek philosophy called Pyrrhonism, after a guy named Pyrrho, who I believe lived around 325 BC. So just as I think that's around the time of the death of Alexander, he's gotten over into India, potentially, although there's, there's a lot of record of him having been to India. In the Greek record, there is not as far as I know, any record of him having been in India on the Indian side, which is kind of interesting because he apparently got somewhere near Taxila, which is like a university town. When I say university town, it's like, I think it was a one of the oldest universities in the world was there. And so there's no question that the Greeks got to India. They definitely set up a bunch of things. It's just like, the question of like why the Indians don't mention this particular guy, Alexander, whom the Greeks make a big fuss about. So what is going on in this book? It's actually a really hard book to summarize, even though it's very repetitive in some ways. The book is about the question of whether early Buddhism might be quite different from what we now know as Buddhism. There may have been two kind of branches in it. So the first one is a more forest ascetic understanding of, you know, basically you go off onto the solo mission into the forest and seek enlightenment on your own. And another kind of urban monastic kind of Buddhism that is more like other religions potentially may have at some points been more influenced by things like Zoroastrianism and other Central Asian religious movements. Uh, there's kind of links across this Silk Road. And so in this argument, original Buddhism, which of course you can never fully really say exactly what original Buddhism is, we can't say, we know very little about what the original, what, what the Buddha himself thought, what he said. Now, this is, if this is all contradicting stuff that you may know about Buddhism, in this book, there's a strong argument that the Pali Canon is not the earliest source we have for what the Buddha himself may have thought. So in this understanding, the Pali Canon comes together after two separate waves, or, or it starts to come together under one wave under Ashoka in like, let's say the first century BC, when Buddhism starts to become more like a state religion. Um, or if not a state religion, just more like an organized religion, let's say, as opposed to just like a random group of guys who've done a bunch of meditation in the forest, it starts to become more like what we think of when we think of, you know, the kind of Abrahamic religions, let's say, or Zoro Zoroastrianism. Now, and then there's a second wave called Pure Land Buddhism, which may have other influences from other religions as well. I don't remember exactly the details of that, but basically in this understanding, there's pre-sectarian Buddhism is much simpler even than Theravada Buddhism. So if you know about a bit about Buddhism, there's kind of three divisions that we, at least in the West, talk about. And those are Theravada, which is also sometimes called Hinayana, which is the earliest, what we normally think of as the earliest form of Buddhism. And its defining feature, if it has one, is it's what's called the Arhant ideal, where the kind of 
ideal outcome of following this set of practices is, and it's not, you know, not, not subscribing to beliefs. Buddhism is not, especially pre-sectarian Buddhism is not so much about beliefs. So the understanding of Theravada Buddhism or Hinayana, which the, which is what the, the Mahayana call them. Mahayana means greater vehicle. Hinayana means lesser vehicle for reasons that may become clear as I talk a little bit about them. And those, so, so Theravada Buddhists don't really like the term Hinayana because it implies that they're not as good as the Mahayana. Um, but they have this Arahant ideal, as I mentioned, which is the ideal being individual enlightenment. So basically you go out into the forest, you follow this set of practices and you attain liberation from suffering and the cycle of samsara, the cycle of what is often thought of as rebirth. But if you read my article on dependent origination, you might be aware that I have a kind of different view that's come from people like Lee Brasington, which argues that dependent origination is not about reincarnation. It's not about rebirth. It's actually about the ending of suffering and the way that suffering arises in daily life. So I'm going to put a link to that article because that is quite significant to what I am thinking about and doing now. And I can put that in the chat. And I think I'm even able to show it to you. And so there's that link. So that's a link to my blog and you can read the article on dependent origination. And if you want to receive that somewhere else, you can also look at my, I believe it's pinned on my Twitter and it's also on my Patreon. So basically if we show you those two, there's, I'll show you that one. Yeah, there we go. So there's Twitter and Patreon. And if you'd like to support what I'm up to, I know I've been relatively silent over the past month or two, but that is not because I've not been working. In fact, I've been working very hard, doing lots of writing, as well as applying for certain kinds of fellowships at the moment. And um, so, yeah, to go back to this Buddhism, basically, Theravada Buddhism is what I've kind of mainly been exposed to. If you're aware of things like vipassana.org, um, or, or just the Vipassana movement, which is sometimes associated with, well, I think it is associated with SN Goenka, even though the, the term Vipassana is an ancient one and, and not associated with any specific part of Buddhism. It's, it's a part of all part, you know, it's an aspect of all parts of Buddhism. And this is the understanding of insight meditation where you are taking the concentrated mind, which you get through concentration meditation and focusing it on the nature of experience, and that leads to certain kinds of insights. I feel like I might be going all over the place because this book, Greek Buddha, is like mind-blowingly important for what I'm doing, but I have literally no idea if anyone outside of my brain can understand why or why this is important. So Theravada Buddhism, basically Arhan ideal, we're gonna go out, learn these difficult practices, learn to get move through what are called the jhanas the the concentration states and then turn that focused mind on the nature of experience and in experience we will see these three characteristics um i'm kind of describing actually really the earliest part of buddhism so even though this is part of theravada I'll, let me let me come back to that in a second basically theravada buddhism arhant ideal you want to get enlightened you go sit in the forest alone you go and do that and get enlightened and then come back and well i don't know if there's a prescription for what you do after you, after enlightenment but basically this next form of buddhism that at least we in the west divided up into is mahayana and this includes things like zen that you may have heard of it also includes um the movement that that came from which was kind of this i think it's like a kind of fundamentalist movement in china called chan and there's one in uh Korea called Sion or something like that. I think it's S-E-O-N. I don't actually know how you say it in Korean, but these are big parts that, of, you know, Western Buddhism is highly influenced by Zen Buddhism. And 
Mahayana in general, which I think encompasses a lot more groups than that. I'm not like super up on it. Has what's called the Bodhisattva ideal. And so this ideal means that rather than being an a lone guy and I just go up on the mountaintop and seek my own enlightenment in the forest or wherever. Instead of doing that, I am foregoing my own enlightenment for the benefit of others. And this is what the Bodhisattva does. And so it's just a different understanding of what the ideal outcome is. And in Beckwith's argument, the steps leading up to Mahayana are a kind of mixing with other religious things that are going on in Eurasia, basically, because it goes quite far. Obviously, if it's going from Greece to India, then that's quite far. And it may be, he has a whole separate argument that the Buddha is actually Scythian. Apparently, that's what he, he's arguing that you sometimes hear this word shak, Shakyamuni or something like that. And the Shakya in that, I guess, is like Scythian. Um, and I don't know a huge amount th about the Scythians. I think they were metal workers. They, they like, I think they lived between 900 BC and 200 BC or something like in what is like Northern, um, like the Northern steppes kind of thing. Um, I'm pretty sure like the Russians excavated or the Soviets really excavated like a big, they, they used to do these like mountaintop, um, Kind of burials i did see there was a scythian uh exhibition i think it was at the it was somewhere in london it might have been the british museum or something like that and so maybe it was the national gallery i'm not sure but anyway the um the yeah they were crazy metal workers and then i have this tomas mon the magic mountain he sometimes calls if you've read that calls uh, Claudia, Claudia Shoshot or whatever her name is, he calls her Scythian. He also calls her just, I think she, he talks about her being from Dagestan and he, he just mixes up all these kind of Central Asian tropes, I feel like. And so why am I saying that the Buddhist is a Scythian? I'm not sure why, but the Beckwith thinks that this is quite important. And, and it may be, although I'm not yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll leave that to one side. So what is the overall argument? The overall argument is early Buddhism is even more stripped down than Theravada Buddhism. For example, even things that seem critical to all parts of Buddhism that we know, things like the Four Noble Truths, which you may have heard of, or the Eightfold Noble Path, those are not part of pre-sectarian Buddhism. Beckwith tries to argue that normative that pre-normative or pre-sectarian buddhism is even more stripped down than that so i think he usually uses the term pre-sectarian so this implies before it was kind of divided up i guess whereas oh no sorry i've said the wrong thing he calls it pre-normative buddhism which means that in his telling buddhism before let's say 200 bc so the buddha is born sort of like five something BC, 500 BC. And I think, he, does he die 486? Maybe I'm confusing him with someone else. Anyway, he, um, he, that period from, let's say 500 BC to 200 BC is really about the Arhan ideal. And most of the things we now associate with Buddhism are not in there, but some things critically are. So what is in there? One, the three characteristics. Um, Buddhism says it's not so much a metaphysical assertion as it is an invitation to investigate your own experience. And that claim is that every experience we have, one, is impermanent, two, is unsatisfactory or possibly unsmooth, if you believe Beckwith's argument, unstable, unsatisfying, un... there's another word I want to use, like uncertain, maybe. Uh, there's this level of anxiety or uncertainty in it. That would be a kind of potentially compatible reading of what the word dukkha, which in, in Pali means. And the others are anicca, the um, impermanence. And the final one is 
anatta, like not self or I don't think I think the emptiness thing comes comes later, the the shunyata, but like anatta means not self. So basically you've got three things about every experience. You're watching me right now. There's no part of this experience of watching me or listening to me that is permanent, right? It's constantly shifting as I say different words. It is has no essence really. <laughs> it has, well, let's say a simpler way would be that you seem to be having this experience. There seems to be a self that is having that experience for most people that illusion is quite persistent and yet there's no part of the experience that you can point to and say that is myself so for example you're you may be seeing me move my hands now your eyes are watching me move your you know your eyes are watching this movement on the screen there seems to be something happening behind the eyes that is a self but is that self stable or is it kind of relational to what's going on the Buddha doesn't like strongly claim that there is no self. That's not really the claim. The claim is that you can't, if you seek a stable self, you can't find one. So it's a slightly different claim from saying the self doesn't exist. That kind of claim about the self exists or the self doesn't exist. The Buddha is not really into those kind of claims. So those are the three characteristics. The first one is that things don't last or, or let's say, yeah, experiences don't last. Experiences don't permanently satisfy. They don't satisfy. They are uncertain, maybe. They are anxiety-ridden. They, I mean, the classic translation that you may have heard is that they are suffering. That's a little bit... That is not the most favored translation anymore, although it was for many, many decades. So it would be totally normal if, if you understand dukkha, the word dukkha to mean just suffering. Um, as in it would it would be expected. Uh, in Beckwith's telling, it might not be the best translation. A lot of people have had their own views on on and and sort of tried to dispute these. And then the final characteristic of the three characteristics is that it is not self. So basically, we've got impermanent, unsatisfactory, and not self. And those are the three characteristics of Buddhism. They go back to the very beginning, as far as we can tell. So this is one thing that is very definitely in all parts of Buddhism and seems to be a feature of the absolute earliest stuff. The other thing, which is obviously really exciting to me, is that dependent origination, this complex thing in Pali, it's called Paticca Samupada. And that seems to also go back to the beginning. And for me, this is really important. But actually, just to go back to the three characteristics for a second, the reason Beckwith is so keen on these three characteristics is what, what little we know of this other Greek guy, Pyrrho, and I realize this is all over the place because the book is the book that I'm talking about is called Greek Buddha. And it's very, um, it's hard to follow. It's, it's a pretty academic and like pretty dry text and it's pretty repetitive but if he's right or kind of even if he's not right it's just such an amazing argument so basically he tries to prove that the three characteristics also show up in what this greek philosopher pyrrho claims about pragmata which are it's also hard to translate i thought it was like an action word because i have this sense that pragma pragma is like pragmatics something to do with action but i could be wrong about that and so pragmata basically uh pyrrho's claim is that all pragmata are undif undifferentiated unstable and what is the other one so it's astath meta um adiaphora and now i'm forgetting the third one but anyway uh, Beckwith tries to argue that these three very things also show up in Greek skepticism. Now, that's a lot of Buddhism that I just talked about, and I feel like I want to explain why I find this so important and why I find skepticism so important. So I'll try and give a little background on that. So skepticism 
is a term that we now understand to mean kind of just like generally doubting things or being critical or something like that. In this early understanding of skepticism, there's kind of, they kind of fragments into two types of skepticism. Arguably, it it fragments very early on, or, or there's a, there's there's been a confusion about this for for thousands of years. Basically, I'm going to talk about the first type of skepticism, also known as Pyrrhonism. So, if you've read Michel de Montaigne or you've read uh, Blaise Pascal, Pascal and Montaigne both get affected by a later translation of this this Roman skeptic who claims to sort of be a, he seems to be a Pyrrhonist. He's also an empiricist. This is a whole other bag of worms. I'm not going to get into the empiricist thing. But basically, Pyrrhonist skepticism is skepticism in that time means something like investigator. So it doesn't mean just doubting things randomly. It means like continuous investigation of something. And the story is that they start as dogmatists. So you we dog, dogmatic is still a, obviously a word that we have today. And a dogmatic view for a skeptic is any view on a non-evident matter. So they are not skeptical of like, you know, is this a little travel mouse that I have on my desk? That they're like, that's fine. But something like, you know, judgments, they're very, they, skeptical is the wrong word. They don't like the, the view that things are good or bad by nature. So let me, like, I could say like, um, education is good for you, which is like, seems like an uncontroversial view. The skeptics would be like, nah, just like we, that that's, we shouldn't go into that view because you know you could think you could imagine situations where education turns out to be bad for you or something like that and they have all kinds of ways of, of starting arguments now there's another form of skepticism that comes about later so basically the skeptics start out as dogmatists right so they they what a dogmatist is for a skeptic is someone who thinks there is one truth and on non-evident matters and they think they know what it is so in this group gets lumped the Stoics, for example, the Epicureans, the Platonists, of course, the Aristotelians, and all of these early forms of Greek philosophy, virtually all of them, the skeptics regard as dogmatic. And that's because they think there's a truth and they think they know, they think they've found it basically. And yet the truths that each of these kind of different groups has found, they're mutually incompatible. And the skeptics are like, hang on, so how do we arbitrate this debate? And this comes to be called the problem of the criterion. And so let's say, let's say you're, let's say I'm an Epicurean and you're a Stoic. And I'm like, obviously the highest good is pleasure, right? Because I'm an Epicurean and you're a Stoic. And you're like, no, the highest good is virtue. Well, the skeptics are like, there's no way to arbitrate this debate because Let's say we could get, let's say we could both agree on someone to ar arbitrate this debate. Who would be like, how would that arbiter themselves have authority? And they think that there's always an infinite regress in these kind of questions. So basically, who knows what's right or wrong in this like seemingly simple question? Well, then you're going to need some other level to be added on to basically decide who's right in this dispute. But then how will you decide that that guy was right? You know, and so there's to them, there's like kind of no end to this, but to their apparent surprise, what they found was that as long as they continued the investigation, in other words, as long as they kept an open mind to every question of this type, the pragmata, which are basically questions on non-evident matters, things like is education or good or bad? Now, one view would be to say it's good. The other view would be to say it's bad. Now, for both of the skeptics, or both of those views for the skeptics are dogmatic, basically, because they can never be sufficiently logically proved. And in a way, you know, the skeptics are not, it's not that they're, it's like that they have a really high bar for what they think is going to be a certainty. And they think that the, do the dogmatists are basically stopping too soon and concluding, well, we know it's good and we have these arguments. And yet they're ignoring arguments that are inconveniently the opposite of what they're trying to prove, right? 
So one dogmatic response would be it's good. Another would be that it's bad. Now, there's another thing that comes about, which is sometimes called academic skepticism and not to be confused with pureness skepticism, although outwardly there's some similarities that make it a little bit annoying to, to understand. Like the pureness position is quite is subtle and it's been systematically misunderstood uh, if you if you believe Beckwith. And, and I think I think it's fair to say that Pyrrho has been misunderstood. And probably I'm going to, I mean, Beckwith would also say the Buddha has been misunderstood by people like Nietzsche, for example, who said, who seems to associate Buddhism with a kind of nihilism when the Buddha was very clear in some of the early suttas that he's both opposed to eternalism and he's opposed to nihilism or annihilationism. Now, why am I getting excited about this? Well, you might be able to hear where the Pyrrhonists are going, right? So Pyrrhonism says we're opposed to dogmatism, which is basically having non-evident views of, sorry, having views on non-evident truths. And on the other hand, it's opposed to academic skepticism. So on the question of is education good or bad, a dogmatist would say, yes, it's good or no, it's bad. But an academic skeptic would say, we can never know the truth to that. And therefore we should just not talk about it. Now the skeptical position, the, the Pyrrhonist skeptic position in the middle, you can see why I'm excited. This is like the Buddhist thing, right? Eternalism, nihilism, the Buddha is going to give you a middle way between these two extremes, right? That's ex the, the question where he, fir in my view, this is controversial, where he first makes this distinction and says there is a middle way is not about asceticism and hedonism, which is also kind of interesting because that's the Stoic and Epicurean thing. It's actually between whether the self that performs an action and the self that follows an action is the same self. So someone asks him, like, if I go for a walk and then I come back, am I the same self? And he says, no. But then they say, okay, am I a different self? And he says, no. So basically he negates both sides of this. And he says, there's a middle way, which says that there's, it's neither that it's the same self, nor is it a different self. So to, you might remember the ship of Theseus question. And his answer would be, is, you know, is it the same ship? No. Is it a different ship? No. Right. So <laughs> kind of interesting that, it, that it's all negation. Also interesting because the Buddha, you know, as I said before, Anicca, um, Dukkha and, um, Anatta, right? These three things. Now, what are they? They're negations of permanence, of satisfaction or sukha, and they're and a negation of self, Atman, right? Something like that. So the and and the Pyrrhonists also provide three negations. And I think it's important that they're that they represent negations. So how do I zoom out of this for a second? The Pyrrhonists are saying we oppose both dog dogmatism, which asserts that there is one truth and we know it, as and we also negate, we also argue against full-on academic skepticism where you say the truth is just unknowable and we therefore give up the search. So what do the Pyrrhonists propose instead? They say you never give up the search. Instead, on the question of is education good or bad? The dogmas to say, yes, it's good. No, it's bad. The academic skeptics say, we can never know. So therefore, let's not talk about it. The skeptics say, well, the, the Pyrrhonist skeptics say, the followers of Pyrrho, and arguably these guys are Buddhists, they say we must never cease <laughs> from our investigation. So basically, let's try out the idea that it's good. Let's try out the idea that it's bad and never settle on one. And if we, we start to think, oh, no, now I think it's good, then we come up with arguments against it. So basically, there's a strategy of kind of opposing these things against each other. Now, Buddhism also does this, as I said, they oppose both eternalism, the idea that the soul lasts, or that the self is the same across actions. And they oppose annihilationism or nihilism, which is basically to say that there is no self, they don't subscribe to that, you may have heard that they do. Um, but that's not 
accurate, at least when you're talking about very, the earliest forms of Buddhism. So Beckwith is trying to ar draw this big argument that not only pulls in Greek philosophy and says that skepticism, which, as I said, comes to be, it becomes important again in the 16th century when it gets retranslated. And by the way, if you're thinking about reading any of this, I would recommend, uh, what's his name, Sextus Empiricus. Pyrrho wrote very few, right, left very few writings. There are some pretty funny things about him in Diogenes Laertius. Of course, if you know him, you know that he's a problematic source. Uh, the lives of eminent thinkers or lives of eminent philosophers, I think it's called. And then finally, Sextus Empiricus, who, you know, a bit like how we have Epicurus, we don't have very many writings from him, but then we have this guy, Lucretius, who writes um, this stuff in the, I think it's like first century AD, right? It's, maybe it's first century BC. I get, I get it confused. Anyway, it, it all got blown up in Herculaneum, I think. But basically, there's this Greek guy. We have very little of his writing. Actually, the Stoics are like this too, right? There's no no Greek Stoic writers that we have their writing, but we have a bunch of these Roman writers that later transmitters of of the schools or sects that are formed by these Greeks. Same goes for Pyrrho. We've got Pyrrho, who we have almost nothing from. We have this thing called the Aristocles fragment or something like that, the Aristocles Pact passage, and it's all third hand. It's it's very complicated to get any clear grasp about exactly what Pyrrho is on about. But that is, if you're interested in that, Beckwith's book is, is fantastic because it, it really gets into to how these things line up. And then finally, um, so yeah, Sextus Empiricus writes a bunch of books, including one called Outlines of Skepticism. And I would recommend that book. I just find it hilarious. Um, it's a weird read. It, I mean, like, just to give you an example, like, they give you lots of strategies for stopping arguments with dogmatists. So like, let's say a dogmatist says humans are good, like human nature is good or human nature is bad. Now, this is the kind of argument. One, interestingly, it doesn't seem to happen in ancient Chinese philosophy or it does, but it, do it doesn't happen until quite late on, whereas it happens pretty early and not early, but like, you know, what, is, what does early mean? But like it's happening in Greek philosophy already, you know, certainly by the time of Socrates is starting to, you know, become a kind of central question. Now, this is exactly the kind of question where the that the skeptics would hate, right? Like the especially Pyrrhonist skeptics, Pyrrhonist skeptics would say, this question could never be settled. Let's just keep flipping it back and forth. Whereas the academic skeptics would say this question can never be settled. And here's why and you should shut up. And I said earlier that they're easily confused. And it's because they deploy some of the same arguments to undermine the dogmatists because they're both opposed to dogmatic positions, right? So the final thing I would just say is that, uh, yeah, well, one, Sextus Empiricus is hilarious. He uh, basically talks like, so So let's say a dogmatist comes to you and says, human nature is good. And another dogmatist says, no, human nature is bad. And they're like, you're a Pyrrhonist skeptic, come in and arbitrate this debate. And the fun thing that you get to do in this position is say, what do you mean by a human? And they're like, uh, I did not expect the conversation to go that way. Everyone knows what a human was, is. And they say, well, if they say everyone knows what a human is, say, yeah, well, everyone knows what a dog is too. Why isn't it, how do, how do you differentiate these two things? And apparent, that's a de Democritus apparently used the definition by saying, or was it Democritus? Uh, yeah, I think Democritus said a human is what everyone knows. Like we all know what a human is. And so like the the Pyrrhonist skeptic would say, oh yeah, well then what is it? Like I'm just not, like this is a way to just stop the argument, right? And then the other way, so Epicurus apparently says a human is what I'm pointing at like this. And, he's, and then the skeptical, the Pyrrhonist skeptic will say, okay, so what about women? Like are, are women human? And so they say that you can only point at one um, person at a time and you can't point on at everyone on earth. So basically I would recommend reading Sextus Empiricus. He's funny. Um, this, I, no one knows exactly when he lived. So he's a Roman author. I think it can't be any later than about 220 AD because we have something else that's like dated that refers to him or something like that. Um, but he could be as early as like 100, but I think like, so, so let's say like he's about 200 AD, which means that he's, you know, like 500 years after Pyrrho. So if he is 
a Puranist skeptic and there it's a little bit weird. It's a little hard to understand exactly everything that's going on in the outlines of skepticism, but I would recommend that. I would also recommend Christopher Beckwith's Greek Buddha. It is very good. And I hope that this video, which is going to be published on YouTube and I just kind of impromptu started recording it and then ended up talking. I tried to tell you about the relationship between Greek philosophy and Buddhism. It's going to be posted on YouTube. So you can watch it after this. If you are happen to be on the live stream and don't get to see it, I will post, I post everything onto patreon.com slash Brian cam, which you can see in the bottom here. So if you would like to support my odd little rambles like this one, where I talk about Buddhism and skepticism and possibly confuse you, hopefully I didn't, um, I will post this also on Patreon so you can look at it later. And if you have any questions, I would love to hear them. I'm going to need to go in a second. So I think I will just probably leave it there. And thank you for watching this. If you would like to contact me, you can go on twitter.com forward slash Brian Cam. I am also on Mastodon, if that's like a thing that you do. I've actually been there since like 2018, which is a long story why that is. Um, and that is be that is um, also a thing that I use. And so I'm going to show you my Mastodon, which is on writing.exchange. Oh, no, I did it wrong. Because um, in fact, this is... You need that little at symbol, I think, on Mastodon. Let's see if that's correct. I think that's right. So um, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you so much for listening. And I just wanted to let people who occasionally browse my YouTube channel know that I'm still alive and I'm still thinking about stuff. And hopefully that wasn't too much for one stream. I'm going to talk about it a little bit more in the future because it connects to what I was working on in terms of dependent origination. It's going to eventually connect to a lot of other complexity stuff and Darwinian thinking and a bunch of other things that I'm working on. If you would like to hear about any of that, please get in touch. I would love to hear, have a DM from you on one of these platforms. And yeah, I'm going to leave it there. Thanks for watching.